Good morning, all. Uh, as mentioned, I am the technical fellow for cybersecurity engineering at Motional. The thing about cybersecurity is that it is an unending battle to try to convince people not to do what they really want to do. Uh, so this morning, what I'd like to talk about is the supply chain. Um, we tend to think about this data center on wheels, as I call it, for autonomous vehicles. And anyone who doesn't believe that it could possibly be that bad, the latent heat that comes off of the compute in the vehicle is sufficient to cook pizza. Um, no one wants me to cook pizza on the top of a very expensive compute platform, but that, that's the way of things. So we are doing some serious uh, cycle processing here. Over the, the past couple days, I've mentioned on and off the AVCDL, and we'll get into a little bit of what that is. Now, you'll notice in the lower right-hand corner, it says this lovely statement that this work was created by Motional and is licensed under Creative Commons. All the work that I'm about to discuss is available under Creative Commons. You can access it. You can do whatever you wish with it, per se, as long as you just give credit uh, for it. But it is really important that we make sure that cybersecurity is not something that we are putting under a lid somewhere that people can't get access to. It, it is not some secret sauce. It, it is a fundamental methodology to ensure that we have safe vehicles. These are safety critical cyber physical systems and we really need to treat them as something other than a, uh, a cost center or a, a way to kind of increase the subscription model. So the AVCDL, I was hired at Motional to try to answer the question, how do you take these regulations and these standards and translate it down into something that can be appreciated and implemented by people who don't read standards and don't know about the various jurisdictional um, language that is in the regulations? And so I looked at it and said, well, you know, how hard could this, this problem be? And I'm four and a half years into this process, <laughs> and I have read way more things than I care about. The AVCDL started out as the Autonomous Vehicle Cybersecurity Development Lifecycle, uh, and really I'm uh, going to be renaming it because as soon as I hit the supply chain, it was like, well, they don't build autonomous vehicles, they build sensors or uh, they build uh, communications units that we're interfacing through, and I need them to be secure. So I'm going to go from autonomous vehicle to a versatile, because that's what it is. This is not about autonomy. This is about cybersecurity development. And at its most stringent, you can apply it to autonomy, to our safety critical systems. But you can crank back the dials, if you will, and you can apply it to things which aren't in the direct safety critical path. And you still have the same processes, the same activities that are undertaken. This is the AVCDL's framework. It chunks things up into fundamental stuff, stuff that you always do. Training, <laughs> things you want to have, roles and responsibilities. Under 21434, you must have designated roles and responsibilities for things. You can't just bring in your cousin's high school age kid to pen test your system, even if they are available for cheap. You have to have tool chain support. If you have a system under R156 that says, you know, you're going to have to support security updates for the next 10, 12, or if the EU would have its way, lifetime of the vehicle, then that means you have to have a tremendous amount of support for your tool chains, all of your licensed products, in order to be able to replicate those products, because the changes that you get to put into the vehicle 
have to not, as we say in medical, break the box. You cannot disturb the functional state of the software as certified. That's a huge expense that's going to become more evident over the years. Plus, we have, you notice there are three colors. The, the blue is the foundation stuff. You probably do it once, like your threat prioritization plan, your incident response plan. You're going to use that for every single product that you do. You're going to want to have it consistent, because otherwise, it's more work for you. The green bits are the building of the, of the thing that you're going to be doing, everything from requirements through, through to release. You'll notice at the bottom of those, we have phase gates. Um, this should not be of any surprise to anyone. The last two bits are kind of more interesting because in our operational phase, when we have the operational technology folk involved, we're dealing with the actual incident response. We're dealing with software deployment. And if your software deployment and software provisioning and software update are not a single consistent process, you're killing yourself with uh, too much duplication of work. And finally, we have decommissioning processes. And this is the one that tends to, to really catch people internally um, and may kind of trip up safety people. It's like, well, why, why do you care in cybersecurity about decommissioning? Don't you just like crush it and you're done? It's like, no. When I have these systems, they're going to have cryptographic things in them. They're going to have certificates that I care about. They're going to have PII that I care about. Decommissioning is not just decommissioning. Decommissioning includes RMA. If you have a system that you pull out of the vehicle and you need to send it back to its supplier to have it worked on, what do you need to do in terms of securing the data that's in there to ensure that your secrets don't get leaked accidentally. All of these bits and pieces I ended up having to consider when constructing the AVCDL. The AVCDL itself has grown over four and a half years. Uh, I mean, it, it didn't start out this huge thing. It was fairly moderate. Uh, there's a primary document which describes the processes writ large. There are roughly 70 secondary documents that talk about all of those activities that you saw on the previous slide. And they detail everything. There are blog posts that I wrote as a gentle introduction for management level folk to be able to appreciate why we do these things. Why do we need traceability? You know, what's this deal with traceability? Can't we just be agile? Uh, additionally, uh, there is a whole set of elaboration. Because it's great that I sit on ISO committees and talk to other people who sit on ISO committees and such. But as soon as I take that information and bring it down to the level of, all right, development team, I need you to tell me what static analyzer settings you're using. It's like, why? We, do, we, use, we use static analysis. Therefore, we're good. Static analyzers have huge numbers of settings. Which ones did you use? Why did you pick them? Are they used consistently? Well, why do I need to know that? It's like, because if you have cryptography in your system, and you use the null cipher for the encryption suite, have you actually done anything useful with cryptography? Obviously, no. Implementation is right. Configuration is pointless. So there's stuff that explains uh, in, in more manageable terms what's happening there. The AVCDL has also been assessed. To my knowledge, oh, just to, as a reference, the full presentation, including the, the script for it, will be up on the AVCDL site, as are all of the major presentations that, that I've created for it. So yeah, you'll be able to get all of these slides in, the, in their wonderful uh, 300 DPI glory. Um, 
But the, the AVCDL, to my knowledge, is the only publicly available cybersecurity lifecycle which is fully documented and it's been assessed twice by two sued. Now, the distinction between an assessment and a certification is that a certification, for those of you who have been through the process, is kind of a spot check. It's like, well, show me all your documents, and you say, look, here, here's a huge amount of documents. And they say, great, let's dig into this one, or let's dig into that one. An assessment is we did a line by line in both ISO 21434 and R155 through every single work product and every single requirement and showed how the AVCDL was compliant. And I have the two pieces of paper, and those are also up on the site. <laughs> so if you'd like to look and see what exactly got assessed, uh, it's there. There are things which are not assessed as compliant because I don't make assertions that I'm doing project management, because that belongs to the organization. That's handled by somebody else's standard. Uh, don't do other people's work. <laughs> don't speak for other people. I don't speak for safety. Safety speaks for safety. I say, I need this from safety. I'm going to give this to safety. But that way, we never get out of sync that way. This is the assessment timeline. For those of you who've been, who've been looking at it as I kind of ramble on here, you'll notice a couple of things. One is that it took 19 months before I was ready to go to the, get the actual assessment. That's after me looking at 21434 and figuring out what are all the bits I need. And then it took eight months to get through that assessment. Let that settle in for all of those of you who think, Oh, we'll just do our product, and then we'll get assessed, or then we'll get certified, and we'll be all good. There were 14 rounds of feedback that had to be addressed. This is after the 19 months of working with Tuve, feeding them. These are the kind of things I'm thinking about. So if you're not talking actively to your certification body, they're... Um, their support group, if you will, then expect that it's going to take longer than you think. Now, when we get to R155, that becomes simpler. That only took six months. <laughs> and that's because working with the same certification body and all the things we learned from the eight months for the previous one. So big takeaway from this is don't anticipate that you're just going to be able to go in cold because if you do this at the end of your product cycle, and you try to make this happen, and they punt it back to you, and it's something fundamental, remember that I mentioned traceability earlier? <laughs> if they say, oh, you know, we don't see that there's traceability here. How did you establish traceability from your design into something, and you don't have that? What, you're going to retrofit traceability? So standards and regulations are always this big mess when it comes to people who actually do things. This is our ecosystem as it, as it currently is today, just kind of as a rough. At the bottom here, we've got uh, ISO 9000 and IATF 16949. Now, who here knows what 16949 is, just kind of offhand? OK, cool. <laughs> Uh, points for your house. It's the QMS, basically. You have to have something that's doing document tracking. Why? Traceability again. Above that, we've got 15288, which is the systems development lifecycle. And in their infinite wisdom, they decided to call uh, both 15288 and 12207 SDLC. Uh, 12207 is the software development lifecycle, which is probably more commonly understood. Above that, we have um, ISO SAE 21434. If I don't say SAE, whenever I go to an SAE meeting, they get upset with me and say, it's ISO SAE. Um, this is like the, the thing that goes on between UT Austin and um, Texas A&M. But we won't go there. 
Now, you'll notice that what we've got there, or got here, is that these blue things are ISO and other international standards. These are technical governing documents. They are not regulation. They are what we would call a codified industry best practices. Floating above that is the UN regulation. Now, one of the things that people get confused about is UN versus UNECE. Um, in the context of the United States, if a senator from Nebraska proposes a law, it is not the, it is not the Nebraska law, it is US law. The UN has six economic zones. The European one is the one that happens to have ownership of WP29, Working Party 29, which is responsible for automotive harmonization. Everything from brakes to headlights to cybersecurity. Um, these are UN regulations, which is why you'll see them properly as UNR. For fun fact, the United States is part of two economic zones. North America and Asia Pacific. Why? Because the United States has a lot of territories in the Asia Pacific realm. So, um, we also have 24089, which is the software update standard. Floating above that is UNR 156. And as mentioned, we had a uh, working group and we just got the uh, synchronization between the two of those. These, uh, the UN regulations point and say, look, if you want to do this, here is what you need to do. It doesn't say you must do 21434 or you must do 24089. It says uh, that this is a way to do it. The certification body's opinions is that that means equal or better to. It's not, I can make up my own and you'll just accept it. You have to be able to show how your way of doing it is going to be equivalent or better than what is in the standard. You can do better? Cool. Prove it. Now, above that we have ALKS, which is the auto lane keeping system. ALKS explicitly says you have to do everything in R155, 156. So don't think you're just going to get away and say, I just do R155, R156. So I get R157 for free and a bag of chips. No, there are individual requirements. And finally at the top we have the uh, the space that, that I'm in, which is the autonomous driving space, and that will no doubt come from the, U, the EU's ARIES proposal. Uh, by the way, at the end of the presentation are three pages of references, all with links, which is a hallmark of the AVCDL. Everything is referenced down to the base references. Um, Fundamentally, R155 is in four chunks. The first chunk is the thing that says that uh, this, is an e, this is a UN regulation and you have to treat it like all other UN regulations, which is kind of pointless, but that's okay. Uh, the next is that you will have a cybersecurity management system and the responsibility for that is fundamentally owned by the OEM, but it must be supported by the supplier. Suppliers have to uh, be held to the same standard by the OEM. Finally, we have vehicle type, which is the totality of all the hardware and software in the vehicle, and that, gets, that is what gets certified. And finally, there's reporting processes. Here's your standard supply chain relationship. Things are driven down from the OEM, they're pushed back up, and maybe get an approval. Just some uh, chunks of information relating to what the, the basic asks in R155 are. 
One of the things about the AVCDL is that uh, since it's intended to be able to translate information, it has to be able to translate it for people like vice presidents. Um, as you get higher up in the, in the management stack, you end up with um, shorter sentences. <laughs> so really what I want to talk about today is supplier selection. That was the, that's the weak point. If you want to do one thing that's going to ensure cybersecurity, it's make sure that you choose your partners wisely. So there are three pieces that I'm going to talk about. And those all feed into what I term here as the tailored cybersecurity requirements. There's no such thing as generic cybersecurity requirements for a supplier. Everyone gets their own. Um, for those of you who have looked at Annex 5 of R155 and said, you know, I'm building this thing and it's completely internal to the vehicle. Why do I care about interference from GNS, sorry, GNSS um, systems? It's like, you don't. <laughs> there are going to be no requirements for you to, to have to deal with that. Yeah, we're going to give you specific requirements. From that, we're going to tailor and create a cybersecurity interface agreement. And we're going to use that cybersecurity interface agreement to drive an SLA. Because if something goes wrong and I need to chase you down, I want to know that you're going to respond to me in a timely fashion because I've got regulators who want data on their terms. And finally, uh, we also drive TARAs and SBOMs. So the first of these is the manufacturer's disclosure statement. I had the good fortune to be helping the, the FDA in some threat modeling workshops that they did and um, had been looking at this thing called the MDS-2, which is the medical device uh, security manufacturer's disclosure statement and ran into its author at one of the shops at one of the workshops that I was facilitating. He was in one of my groups. And basically, I said, it's like, do you guys mind if I use this as a basis for one for automotive? And he said, no, go ahead. So here it is. It's like a, about 120 questions. Now, manufacturer's disclosure statements have been around forever. This one is specifically tailored at um, what you would typically think of as ISO 27001 type of questions. What does your organization do? I want to know how you handle material. I want to know how you handle PII. I want to know how you deal with things like backups. Do you push updates? What are your expectations? How is your documentation? General questions. But I need to have them done. And there's no point in me reinventing the wheel if this is in existence already and considered as it's like, great, within the medical industry, this is standard. You give these out like candy. And you expect your suppliers who are doing RFIs to complete them. So this is the one that, that we have created that we think more appropriately addresses our space. And there are two documents to talk about it. Topics, everything, data backup, storage, confidentiality, connectivity, remote access. I don't want a web server on my LiDAR sensor. I'm sorry. Um, as convenient as that might be. Um, so. The next one is cybersecurity maturity. Uh, this is a topic that's near and dear and causes great aggravation for me as the, uh, the chair of the, uh, the SAE cybersecurity maturity model task force. Um, I took the AVCDL and I took the, um, the SEI, the Software Engineering Institute's CMM levels, and I paired them and give to every supplier. It's like, look, here, these, this is the AVCDL. These are all the processes that we do. We'd like you to tell us what level of maturity you have. If you, and based on the standard, um, five plus zero I, I use, 
because I think you should always have a true zero. I studied math in school, uh, <laughs> among other things. You know, what, what are your, where are you at with things, as I like to say? Now, I tell my SMEs, well, it's like, well, what do we do if they, they say that we have this level of maturity? I said, tell them that if they say, we're at a level three, which means they have practices, and they're done fairly consistently, it's like, cool. We're going to spot check those. You're OK with that, right? <laughs> so you can self-report, and that's wonderful, but don't expect that I'm not going to call you on it. This is a great diagram. And uh, the, the, by the way, the AVCDL has a set of videos, and I, I, I go through this in, um, in one of them on the supply chain, um, where you have the CMM levels, you have you know, what it takes to get there. The purple line at the top, you'll notice the far right, it talks about the uh, diminishing returns. <laughs> You're putting an awful lot of money in, because money is up on the vertical axis, and you're not getting much out. So the idea that you're going to be doing world-class practices, uh, if you have a company that has lots of money to throw at things, there are probably about six in the world, then you can say, sure, let's get that extra 1%. But for most people, the sweet spot is going to be the green zone in the middle, where you're dealing with well-defined processes that you're doing enterprise-wide, and if you're really, really good, you're doing quantitatively controlled things. So you're actually measuring stuff, and you're seeing, it's like, you know, how can I keep this going properly? Um, again, link to this diagram, which is not mine originally, is in, the, is in the references. Now, for those of you who are looking really closely, you'll see that vertical red hash line, which is talking about the negligence threshold. If you are not at least at a level two, you're really not in a position to be in a safety critical space. We take that, we make a summary, we say what they say, we develop the RASIC at this point. And we say, all right, you're going to be doing stuff, we're going to be doing stuff, this is the CIA. We establish all this, this ends up in a longer a longer document where we go back and forth and we say, we'd like you to do this. And they say, you know, we'd really like to do this. And we capture all of that dialogue that, that goes back and forth. But then we take it and we say, you know, we evaluate it and this is what we think. And then we can plot it. So around the edge are all of the ABCDL processes. And we do the spider diagram. So over time, what we can do is we can say, you know, how are things changing? 21.434 requires that you have continuous improvement. If you don't measure, it doesn't matter. If you don't measure, you can't establish continuous improvement, and you certainly can't use it as evidence to your certification body as you get certified over time. The last thing is process mapping. It's all well and wonderful that Charles has an AVCDL, right? Now, no two companies have exactly the same set of processes. But how many of your companies go to the trouble of establishing what the mapping is between them so that you don't end up with things on the floor at the end of the day? One of the most difficult things in the world to do is to realize that you have a gap. And to go back to your supplier and say, oh, we realize that there's a gap. We need this little extra thing. What's the incremental cost of extra things these days? Usually they end in M. <laughs> so what we do is we provide them with a way to create that base mapping. And we say, here. Here's all of the ABCDL processes. Now, this is 21.434 on the, uh, the vertical, and the ABCDL across the top. And we also provide a blank one that says, so 
that's what, this is how we created these processes. Now, we're going to put AVCDL down the side, and you guys put yours across the top, whether it's ASPICE or AutoSAR or BSIM or some other system that you happen to have. It doesn't matter. It's your system. What matters is that we know that we're covering everything, and we can address everything. So this is our gap analysis. Now, for those of you who, um, who like jokes, um, what's the difference between waterfall and the V model? There you go. Um, <laughs> nothing. Typical supplier processes. Now, for those of you who have played with ASPICE, I'm sorry, have played with AutoSAR, no, it is ASPICE. For those of you who have played with ASPICE, it's like, yeah, that looks like ASPICE. That looks like a lift. Sure. So, this is what happens when you map those chunky processes onto the AVCDL ones. You'll notice that the AVCDL has more granularity because life has more granularity. By the way, 21434 doesn't require that you do attack surface analysis. It doesn't require that you do static analysis or dynamic analysis or fuzz testing or penetration testing. Now you're going to say, but, but, but it's in, no, it's in a note. It's not a requirement, and it's certainly not in a work product because it's not in a requirement. Uh, this, this is the distinction we call normative, which are the must-haves, versus informative, which is we have commentary, but we didn't reach consensus on it, so we're not going to make anyone do it. So, you know, where do we go from here? A lot of stuff, a lot of information. Oh, I'm doing good for time. A whole bunch of documents that, that feed together, that lead into things. It's not just here, you know, have these three things, off you go. No. There are, there are documents that give you general commentary. There are templates. There's documents that talk about how to do the templates. And there's where they all feed into. It's like, every piece is important. This is why. Now, the AVCDL, as I mentioned, is uh, available publicly, and this is where it's available publicly. Newtonomy, by the way, is one of the, um, the companies from which Motional was founded. Um, and if you just go to GitHub and type AVCDL, you'll get there. Uh, but that is the, the URL. Now, you know, qualified and trained. This includes your supply chain needs to be trained. With, with some of these things. So there are, uh, this is the training path for the supply chain. The one for the mains is, is much larger. The ones in green are the ones that I have videos created for already. And those videos are up on YouTube. YouTube.com at AVCDL. I have almost 60 su um, subscribers, by the way. Uh, so. <laughs> Please subscribe to the channel. I'd like to make it to at least 100 before I retire. Um, <laughs> but there are 10 videos up there, and they're, they're all available for, for view. Now, oh, the other thing is that all of the materials that go into the videos are also in the repository, including the scripts. So if somebody wanted to take them and translate them into a different language, make a separate audio track, create subtitles, whatever have you, the intent here is that the community have access to this information and be able to utilize it. Um, and Motional has been very generous in uh, giving us the, or giving me the ability to, to make this public. Block Harbor has been a very uh, fundamental proponent, an early proponent, in fact, of the AVCDL. Um, and has, has really supported the efforts uh, of the project. Now, I, just to, to let you know, it's like, yeah, here are all the references. So I'll turn it over for questions.